Well, I think you bring up a great point when you connect the fact that our government is promising so much to so many, and at the same time, we let the government control the value of our money. And all of that would really go against the grain with our founders, who did not see it as the government's task to supply everything to everybody. They saw the government's task to be to protect private property. And that's why they wanted limited government, because they knew it's just the nature of having power that causes people in power to abuse the privilege. I think we're now at a point where we have to ask if we can even trust government to regulate the value of our money. It makes sense to start talking about Madison because one thing the founders realized right off the bat was that if, if governments, and at that time we're talking about colonial governments or independent states, uh, if they can issue debt and then force people to accept that debt and use it as legal tender, that is, if they can issue debt and then say, you have to accept this as money, that gives the government an exorbitant privilege, which is extremely vulnerable to abuse. So one of the first things he wanted to do is to say, if we're going to have a country, we understand a common currency is a great thing. It will help us trade with each other. But one thing we will never do again is allow the government to run up debt and then to issue notes that are really claims to that debt. And the debt is the excess of spending over revenues. We will not allow the government to issue debt to cover that excess spending and force people to use it as legal tender. So the definition of a dollar had nothing to do with, with uh, paper or loans or contracts the government tried to put out to cover its debt. Uh, the definition of money was money is a measure it's a unit of account, it's a store of value, uh, it's a medium of exchange. In other words, what, what Thomas Jefferson wanted to do, because he's the, the man who said, let's define the money unit of the United States. In fact, his early notes were called the establishment of a money unit for the US. A money unit was going to be an unchanging measure just like the number of minutes in an hour, the number of inches in a, in a yard or a foot. Um, Jefferson wanted to say, let's have a uniform measure that, that defines our currency. And he decided that in order to, to make it constant and unchanging, it should be defined in terms of a weight of gold or silver, a precise weight. And he, he envisioned that to be a universal standard in the same way other weights and measures would be. Well, the changes took place over two centuries, but in the last 10 years, as you refer to it, those are years that, that represent an era when the Federal Reserve has, has become such a dominant, overpowering force that we really don't question its ability to manipulate the value of money. And mostly what the Federal Reserve does, and it works uh, for the federal government, and remember the Federal Reserve is an agency of our government. Its chairman, its vice chairman, every member of the Board of Governors uh, are appointed by the President, confirmed by the Senate. So this government agency decides what is the, the value of the dollar, and their idea is that uh, if it loses 2 or 3% a year, no problem. They have decided that, that a little bit of inflation is just fine. They refer to benign inflation. Not realizing, or realizing, but deciding it's more important to maintain this policy tool of government, the ability to manipulate money. But think of a person buys a house. And uh, if, if you keep it for even 10 years, at 2% a year, we'll call that the minimal inflation that the Fed thinks is is so uh, innocuous, 2% uh, in 10 years, 20%. There's a, a distortion. Think, think of a foundation for a building, and it's moving, and it's getting off kilter, 2%. But after 10 years, it's 20% off. And some people own houses for 20 years. And sometimes inflation, like right now, the most uh, recent level of inflation as of last month, annualized for this year, a year when there should be no pressure 
on prices. The last thing you'd expect is inflation when there's unemployment, when consumer demand is down. We still have 3.5% inflation. So think of a, a building on a foundation and it's being moved in, in 10 years, 20 or 30% off of that foundation. These distortions ultimately lead to a crash. And uh, it's no wonder that the housing industry was where it started this time. Even, and in fact, even if you don't see the effects of this, this um, so-called benign inflation in the price of consumer goods, it tends to pool the excess money that the Fed creates by financing the government's debt, pools and assets like housing, uh, like commodities. Uh, you see the price of gold go up. Uh, but but it, it, it's, it's distorting. It's a form of government intervention into free markets that I think is, is more damaging than almost any other area where government treads into the private sector. The moral implications of money that is not sound I think are the most serious aspect of government manipulated money. Just in our society, let's say democratic capitalism, the most important component is in capitalism is, is what you do with capital. And think of what that is. It's financial seed corn. It's the amount that you decide not to consume because you think if I plant this, if I invest it, if I use it to fund some new project, I hope the project's going to be successful. I don't know for sure, but if it is, we're all going to be a lot better off. That's using capital for a more prosperous future, and it's great for all of society, even if the person, the entrepreneur who wants to do that um, is doing it for, in the Adam Smith sense, selfish reasons. He wants to make a profit. But the point is, we, we've learned that our whole society benefits if people say, I'm going to take a risk. And maybe I don't even have the capital. I have to convince someone else to invest in my idea. And it's going to pay off so much that I'll pay him back. I'll earn a profit. Everyone will benefit. And that's how we'll raise the standard of living for society. All of that depends in the idea that it's worth it. It's worth it to sacrifice today. Instead of consuming everything, it's worth it to put something aside. If there is inflation, and, and now this is even exacerbated because the future inflation is also related to the zero interest rate policy, the loose money policy, the Federal Reserve. Think of what happens to someone who makes this moral decision to save for a better future. They turn in the money to the bank. The bank is supposed to find these great investments, these worthwhile entrepreneurs, and make the judgment, it's risky, but we think it's going to pay off. The saver gets zero interest, so there's no compensation for doing it. You might as well consume today. Eat, drink, and be married, because you're stupid if you, if you sacrifice today and you get no interest on it. But second, it's even worse than that. You're an outright sucker because when you get your money back it's worth less. So the inflation, which is I think the most obvious way people differentiate between sound money that keeps its value and money subject to inflation, i.e. the government's ability to manipulate it, to produce too much of it because they think by intervening they'll get a better result or they think by buying up government debt uh, that will help the government handle these excessive burdens it's taken on unwisely, all of that undermines the very moral sense of, uh, of capitalism. And when you say democratic capitalism, well, in a democracy, you're supposed to have equal rights where we all earn our money, and it's up to us to make those decisions of whether to uh, save or invest. The government is, is taking away your ability to plan your ability to count on a store of value. It, it's, it's your money. What if you took it today and you decided just to keep it, not to invest it, not to expose it to any risk, but to put it under your mattress? You take it out in 10 years, and even at 2% inflation, it's worth 20% less. Well, for a government that was set up to protect private property rights, 
They've just taken, without due process, 20% of what you earned. It's worth 20% less through no fault of your own, but because they've not just allowed, but they're relying on their ability to have the money depreciate. I, I think it's highly immoral. It feels amazing to recognize that what would have worked for a country that had gone bankrupt, the Soviet Union, is now very close to what the U.S. needs, what Europe needs. We're really seeing money meltdown. And I, that book was written in 1994. And uh, I think now, maybe it came out too soon. I think we're really seeing uh, the fruits of, of a system that has allowed governments to be undisciplined, to have no automatic correction of fiscal irresponsibility. We've given all of these monetary powers to government. Uh, I was just reading last night um, a new book called Currency Wars. And it's amazing because I see in that book references by the author to um, the very things I was writing about even in the fairly recent past, this idea for Russia uh, to have a gold back ruble. I really think the first country that starts to link its currency to gold now has a chance, especially with the new, new technology. People can use their smartphones to purchase things now. And Google's working on this. And um, I can well imagine we're getting close to that world that Friedrich Hayek talked about, where you have competitive currencies. And as people are bailing out of the euro, and we know the dollar only looks relatively good next to the euro um, because it's being compared to a currency that potentially has two weeks to exist. Um, so the dollar itself, we know, has these uh, huge problems. And uh, we see emerging countries like, like Brazil and Russia or China uh, very unhappy in a dollar-denominated world, and one can well imagine that international monetary reform will come up on the agenda. What, what, if, what if the euro does dissolve or continues to be an, almost an unusable currency as people are looking for alternatives? Um, at what point will we say, rather than, than go back into individual currencies for those countries, wouldn't we be better to move forward to some kind of a new system? And at that point, I think the fear is that the International Monetary Fund or some supranational organization, some, some global central bank will try to emerge. That would be the worst outcome. The lesson should be to go in precisely the opposite direction. Instead of having more government control over money, more ability to manipulate it to uh, cover the sins of government, what we should do is go back to the intentions of the founders who said the private economy is supposed to work for individuals. They should all have equal rights. The role of government is to protect private property rights. That's why we have limited government. And I think people should demand a reliable form of money. And I can't imagine a more universal accepted surrogate for money in the world than, than gold. It has always been seen that way. You could have a sophisticated system that would work readily with financial markets as they are today, but would somehow link a acknowledged unit of account, a new form of money, to gold, which is politically neutral. And um, I'm afraid, I wish it would be a dollar that's linked to gold, but uh, unless the government shows that it's, it's willing to once again have automatic discipline in its fiscal behavior, I, it would be very hard for the U.S. to um, agree to redeem its own currency in gold. But I'd like to start nudging it that way, but uh, it remains to be seen whether we can live within our means and abide by a, a gold convertible system. The Bretton Woods Agreement was, was really an incredible event. And uh, speaking of international monetary reform, mm -hmm. it, it's really helpful, I think, to, to realize that you can do it in the middle of a crisis. The first memo laying out how to structure a new international monetary system
was written one week after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So we're going back to December 7th, 1941. And within a few weeks after that, the assistant to the Treasury Secretary at the time came up with a memo saying what we really need to do is give hope to the Allies who are fighting this war, which looked very iffy at that point, how it would end up. And if those Allies think that they get through this war and we're back to what we had during the 30s, that's not much to look forward to. Because during the 30s, the year of the Great Depression, uh, you had a breakdown in currency relationships, the gold standard had fallen apart, and, um, and so countries engaged in competitive depreciation, meaning they would cheapen their currency, print too much of it, in order to make their goods um, more attractive on the trade front. And they would do it at the expense then of other countries. And that turned into a spiral of everybody depreciating their currency, flooding the world with currencies. So money lost its meaning and there was a breakdown in trade. So the idea early on, as we were getting into World War II, was let's, let's have a vision for the future, something that's worth winning, the war. And they decided that an international monetary fund would establish fixed exchange rates among currencies, so you couldn't run them up or down against each other. Fixed exchange rates, but somehow that would have to be anchored. Well, should everyone agree to redeem into gold? That's one way. That's the classic international gold standard. Every country voluntarily says, if, if we blow it in our budgeting, if we blow it on fiscal, you can always, if you don't trust our currency, you can always turn it in for the gold. So every country bore its own um, errors on itself. That was a good system. But that was seen too difficult for these countries going into war. And so the U.S. said, look, you just make your currency redeemable at a fixed rate into dollars, and we have the strength. We will make sure that the dollar remains convertible into gold at a fixed rate. In fact, if you don't believe us at any point, you foreign countries can turn in those dollars for gold. And the rate is $35, you get an ounce of gold. And that was, that was the agreement. That was Bretton Woods. And it worked great for about 20 years. That was, the, the post-war period was fantastic. All these countries came together to a resort in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods. They signed on to it. Uh, they had to put a certain amount of gold with the International Monetary Fund. And uh, they said, we're going to be part of the system. We will maintain this fixed rate with the dollar. Why did it fall apart? By the late 60s, the U.S. was in Vietnam. At the same time, we, under Johnson, President Johnson, we wanted vast spending programs, the Great Society. It was an era we called uh, guns and butter. We were paying for the butter, which was to make people's lives better. We were paying for the guns to fight the war we started running budget deficits. And um, by 1971, um, now we have President Nixon in, our allies in Europe and around the world who had signed on to the Bretton Woods system were saying, you're inflating. So we are accumulating your dollars because your dollars are buying our goods. Um, but we don't want these dollars. Uh, we think they're worth less and less every year because you keep inflating to cover your excess expenditures, and so we're going to turn them in. We're going to turn them in. We'd rather have the gold. And we also want to put you back on a disciplined approach. And it got to the point where um, Nixon on a Sunday went up to Camp David with his advisors, and he announced later that day, we're ending the system. We're ending Bretton Woods. You cannot turn them in anymore for gold. And for Americans, I think they just thought, well, I, I guess those other countries were taking advantage of us. We don't want to give them our gold. Uh, but for those other countries, this was called the Nixon shock. What's, what's the system now? For them, it was like having the euro disappear. I mean, the, the currency order is gone. And we went into this vacuum of no system but right about then, we had a theory that floating rates were somehow a good thing. 
And I think that has not proven to be true, not at all. I think that has covered the excesses of government spending. Um, of all things that shouldn't be floating, I think a unit of account, a measure, is, is the most important. A measure has to be fixed, has to be constant. But that ended after 71. It was an incredible moment. I wished everyone could have seen it when Congressman Ron Paul asked Chairman Ben Bernanke that question. Now, the Federal Reserve is required twice a year to report to Congress as to what it's doing on monetary policy. This is normally a very boring exercise. I think a lot of our congressmen don't feel comfortable discussing monetary policy. But Congressman Ron Paul knows his stuff. And he said to Bernanke, how do you define a dollar? Now, that's a really loaded question for, for constitutional scholars. They know. They know that Jefferson defined a dollar as um, this many grains of gold or this many grains of, of silver. They know it was uh, defined in these precise terms. So Ron Paul knew exactly what he was doing when he said to the head of our central bank, which takes responsibility for the value of the dollar, he said, how do you define a dollar? And the amazing answer that Chairman Bernanke gave was, well, a dollar is uh, it's what it will buy. It, that can vary from moment to moment. That's the opposite of what the founders had in mind. It's, it's not what it buys moment to moment. A dollar is a measure. It's, it's specific. What it will buy gets into demand and supply, which is constantly changing, very dynamic process. But the one thing we know is the unit of account is, is absolutely defined in terms that never change. So it was amazing as they pursued this conversation. Uh, then then uh, Ron Paul, I thought, rather cleverly said, um, why does the Federal Reserve hold gold, gold certificates? And because actually the U.S. Treasury has uh, 261 million ounces. We're the largest gold holders in the world as an official reserve country. Um, and um, the, the response by Bernanke was, well, it's, it's, it's just an asset. I mean, right up there with mortgage-backed securities and other government agency debt and treasury bonds that the Fed holds. And um, Ron Paul said, well, why don't you hold diamonds? And I thought that was very telling. But the gold is a legacy of what had always been the anchor for U.S. money. We can appreciate the intent of, of those congressmen who are currently trying to put some kind of a limit on the Federal Reserve. They sense that the Fed is out of control. It, it's almost a rogue agency in that it has become so dominant, so powerful a force that financial markets are really paralyzed unless they, they know what Ben Bernanke is thinking. For an agency that was created in 1913 to play a very passive role of temporarily providing liquidity, basically when farmers seasonally needed more money and the banks would run out of cash, then it was the Fed's role to make sure that we could provide the cash, knowing it was always backed by future productivity. Now the Fed is this, this behemoth. So I appreciate when individuals say, well, what we have to do then is start reining them in. Maybe Congress has, has um, given up its own responsibility defined by the Constitution to regulate money. We farm that out to the Fed. The Fed's gotten Potomac fever. So um, now we're going to start reining them in. And, and so you have proposals, for instance, let's change the Fed's dual mandate. Dual meaning they have two tasks. The first one is to maximize employment, the second is to um, to have stable prices, and um, and so these well-intentioned congressmen say, let's eliminate the maximize employment because sometimes those might be at odds, and let's just say the Fed should have stable prices. It's nice, but it's meaningless. I even think it's it's damaging because it's a, a palliative. It's a, it's a false remedy that might give you a sense that you've actually accomplished something. But I guarantee right now, if, if you ask uh, Ben Bernanke or anyone on the um, Federal Open Market Committee, 
if you had the mandate only for stable prices, would you do anything differently? No. It would, they would do nothing differently. So I think that uh, remedies trying to uh, tell the Fed to follow a rule, that doesn't make sense either. And I appreciate that, uh, the, the Taylor rule, named after John Taylor. He has gone back and showed that during Alan Greenspan's time as, as head of the Fed, um, we had relatively uh, benign inflation, and it was a nice time uh, for economic productivity. So if we were to write a, a formula, basically a regression analysis, a formula saying uh, when inflation's this and production's this, um, and uh, prior interest rates are this and inflation's that, and you run it through a kachunka machine, Here's the rule, and if the Fed sticks to that rule, then we would do better. He, he suggests we deviated from that rule, and that's why we ran into problems. But the rule is just a formula um, based on what had happened earlier, and uh, I think every Fed chairman would say, oh, but this is an emergency, so the, the, it's a new situation now. We weren't counting some new event. So we don't want to be locked into a rule. That's one thing. The other is, if you have a rule, then you don't need a federal open market committee. Uh, why should you have a small group meeting in private to decide what policy should be, to use discretion? And I, I think it's impossible to say that they're abiding by a rule unless you make the rule um, automatic, in which case you don't want people who meet privately to make any decisions about it. The beauty of, of really a, a gold standard was that um, since no Fed chairman can be omniscient, they're very, very intelligent, but they're not omniscient, it's saying that we think the, the wisdom of the market and all the millions of people who are actually operating using money and using credit, if any one of those, those persons at the margin says, you know, I think it's getting frothy out here. That last loan I saw my bank made looked very iffy to me. Maybe they're creating too much credit, too much purchasing power. You know, the money supply is going up. I don't trust it. I think I'd rather have the gold. That person at the margin turns in money, takes out gold. Well, what's happened? The money supply just contracted. So now maybe it's a little bit better calibrated to the real level of productivity. Then if someone else says, well, you know, I see lots of opportunity out there, and I think there are many projects we haven't even tapped the potential, then that person is very comfortable seeing the money supply grow larger and larger because he thinks it's covering productive potential, so we need money and credit. The goal is to, to have the right amount of money and credit out there for the real economy the productive economy. The world we're having now is frightening in that there is a disconnect between financial markets and the games played by central bankers and finance ministers and politicians meeting frantically in Europe or here. They're playing a different game where the Dow Jones goes up 200 points one day, down 200 points the next, up 200. It's a crazy game. They should be using casino chips they should be using tokens. That is not the real economy. The, the real economy doesn't bounce up and down like that. It's more like a slow moving barge with seven billion people aboard. We just need money that works. For the people who really want to use demand and supply, who really want to respond to price signals, who say, I, I wouldn't pay this for it, but if it gets to that price, I buy. Well, the only way prices speak the language of commerce is if the money, which is a way, that's what prices are, so much money, if the money is honest and communicating accurately and reliably, then when you see prices go up and down, you say, okay, now I, now I buy or now I sell. The real economy with real individuals who make all those decisions depends on sound money. And that's where I think we're looking at this dangerous disconnect where we're, we're really getting to the point where people will say money is too important to be left to the politicians. We gave them the right to regulate money. They've abused it. They don't give us a good product. 
and either through technology, through these new, as I say, smartphone purchases, we won't go back to the gold standard, we'll go forward. But I think the private sector will get sick of the way money is abused by governments and, and also just see no way out, no way out from the fiscal irresponsibility, which then forces central banks to accommodate it. We're seeing it in, with the European Central Bank, we're seeing it with our Fed. The government overspends, and all the central banks can do is buy up that debt, buy it up, and every time they do, they're kicking more dollars out there. And that idea of how do you define a dollar, it's literally, it's, it, Bernanke's right, it's what it will buy, but that's meaningless as far as planning, because how can anyone know what it'll buy 10 minutes from now, let alone 10 years from now? We need money, that's a store of value, unit of account, as well as a medium of exchange for global trade. The idea of, of treasury trust bonds is, is an initiative that I thought long and hard about. Realizing that there are those who say this, our current monetary system is, is impossible, we need to go to a true gold standard immediately. Very sympathetic to that. At the same time, I've, I've worked with uh, presidential candidates in the past, and I know that uh, it's very difficult to do something uh, that bold, that radical, in, in one step. So I, I have thought, I'm really building on an idea of issuing treasury obligations, redeemable in gold, an idea that came out in 1981, the first year under Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had talked as part of his overall economic in agenda in terms of sound money and honest dollar, and he even did an ad at the time he was running for president in 1980 saying, we will never have dependable money until the U.S. dollar is once again linked to gold somehow. So that this is part of the unfinished agenda of Reagan. But for the specific idea, I find this very interesting, it was actually Alan Greenspan who wrote an opinion piece published in the Wall Street Journal in September of 1981 called, Can the U.S. Go Back to a Gold Standard? And his idea was to say, well, we're running a budget deficit. So if you went to one immediately, uh, you can well imagine that if the Fed continues to fund this deficit by issuing dollars, pretty soon everyone will want to convert the dollars into gold, and so you lose all your gold. So his point was, let's, let's put a marker out there. Let's ease our way into it. Let's test this to see if we could move to a gold standard. Have the Treasury issue five-year notes where at, at the end of five years, uh, you could redeem in gold. So you're saying in advance you get this much gold. And, um, and he thought that was a good way to see at some point uh, would people become indifferent between a U.S. Treasury bond that paid in dollars or a U.S. Treasury bond that paid in gold. Because at the point where people say, I don't care, then you're, you're at convertibility. What you want is people to be indifferent because then they're saying the dollar is as good as gold. Uh, for instance, under Bretton Woods, the idea was you should be indifferent between one ounce of gold and $35. Indifferent. If you start thinking that you'd rather have the gold, well, it's because you don't think those $35 are worth it anymore. They've lost value relative to gold. So, so you can see that it makes sense that you would want to have people looking at a treasury obligation of the U.S. government and, and if it's denominated in dollars, which is what I'm suggesting, um, but I would say on this new version, you give them an option. So for, for instance, here's how it would work. Let's say the U.S. Treasury announces a new instrument and what it amounts to is a five-year obligation at the end of which time you, as the holder of this instrument, if you buy it today, will either get $2,400 or an ounce of gold. What would you pay for that? Well, a person might say, um, gee, you know, uh, it depends what gold is going to be in the future. But that's what we're, what we're talking about. It, we would begin to link the value of the dollar in the future to, to gold. 
And if you think that the Fed is going to be issuing way too many dollars over the next five years, if you think they're going to be, that gold is going to keep going up, say, six or seven or eight percent a year relative to the dollar, I mean, this year alone it's gone up 15 percent. But so let's say you think that's going to at least continue, if anything, get worse. You would much rather have, that implies that five years from now, gold could be worth uh, 26, 27, 3,000 dollars. So for you, uh, you might be willing to pay not just $2,400 today, you might pay a premium because you're getting a future on gold. Five years from now, you'll be able to say, um, give me that gold for $2,400 and I can immediately sell it for more and make a profit. So now we're harnessing the expectations of the market into defining what they think the value of the dollar will be relative to gold in the future. And at the same time, it's a huge signal from the U.S. government that for the first time in so many years, we are linking the future value of the dollar to gold. So you begin to, to establish a beachhead to say the dollar's value should be predictable in terms of gold. But instead of running the risk of the U.S. government saying today, this is the rate of convertibility and risking that we set it too high or we set it too low and there's going to be either a a flood of demand to buy or sell dollars for gold, what you're doing is you're saying, let's harness the expectations of the market. This will tell the Fed, this is a useful information tool, this will tell the Fed what people expect about potential future pooling of excess money it's creating in a commodity, a global commodity like gold. And what the Treasury really needs to do in alignment with the Federal Reserve as a result of issuing what I would call these Treasury trust bonds, they just have to exceed market expectations. Instead of doing even worse than the market expects, they have to do better. So at this point, when we're in such a fiscal mess, it's all about trajectory and having a lower deficit next year than the market expects, doing better having less monetary stimulus than the market expects, doing better, and to start working our way so that someday in the future, and I would do this as a pilot program, but someday in the future, again, we're trying to achieve that point where people don't pay a premium for the gold option because they fully expect the dollar will maintain its value in terms of gold. Now, some people will say, well, this is just such a small step. This isn't going to do it. Uh, others will say, this is so radical, you're one of those um, gold bugs, gold nuts, because how can the treasury lock itself into anything involving gold? I think this is strong enough to focus attention and to get people to saying, why would we do this? Well, because we're trying to get back to the values, but forward to a new system of making money accurate and reliable once more. We're giving government a chance, maybe its last chance, to be responsible in issuing money and to not allow its fiscal imprudence to contaminate its monetary product. You absolutely can't justify money moving around like that. I mean, it's crazy. It, it's embarrassing that um, high officials in our government and in European uh, parliaments talk about a global economy or in Asia, and we, we keep saying we believe in free trade and a global economy. And then, and then here, here you worry about a 3% tariff. We've got to get rid of that. And then you let the money values gyrate 10, 20, 30%. That, that's just, it's ridiculous. I think it makes a mockery out of true competition. It makes a mockery out of the idea that it's an international marketplace. It's, it's like having the Olympics and saying, oh, everyone is welcome to compete and we're all equal and may the best person win who's really worked the hardest and is the most talented. And then you change the rules. You know, you, you jump 12 feet, but we're gonna measure feet for you as this, and you jump 12 feet, we're gonna measure it like this. Why should anyone compete? Why should they have any respect for a system like that?
And uh, no, it's ridiculous that the dollar and the euro would gyrate like that against each other when the relative competitive levels of uh, individuals in, in, on that continent versus this uh, changes and, and should. I mean, we are trying to become more competitive on both sides, but, but that's the effort of, of people trying to be more productive or more innovative. That's legitimate competition. To, have, um, to talk about um, being competitive because the value of the currency has depreciated, that, that's not competing, that's cheating. And, and we should call it as such. It, it could have survived. Um, I don't know now if, if the euro will be able to survive. Uh, I have great respect for Robert Mundell, and he's the Nobel-winning economist, um, very much a, a force behind the supply-side movement and the success of the Reagan Revolution. And, and he did the intellectual groundwork for the euro based on the idea that you can have an optimal currency area if, um, if, if people can move across borders, if they can trade with each other. And um, the, the good part of the euro is to have a common currency. In the same way as I'm saying, if you're going to have a global marketplace, you all have to be using the same unit of account by which you define value for competing goods and services. I mean, that only makes sense. Um, you can have national currencies, but they all then have to abide by the same central monetary unit of account system, which is what an old gold standard did, which is what Bretton Woods did, which is what we need now instead of floating rates. But the problem in Europe is even though they had the right idea with the common currency from an economic point of view, from a historical point of view, the idea for a common currency goes back to Eisenhower's wish after seeing two horrible wars take place on that continent to say, you need a United States of Europe. I mean, you have to quit fighting each other. For the same reasons Jefferson wanted a common currency, you need something to help bind you so you trade with each other, so you don't go to war with each other. So uh, there was a lot to recommend a common currency on both the social, historical, moral, and purely economic and financial aspects. But there was no automatic mechanism for correcting. And you, you still allowed, under the, the Euro rules, the fiscal sins of government to compromise the integrity of the currency. And they had sort of a silly idea, which was, well, if a, if a country runs a budget deficit in excess of the 3%, which we're allowing, um, we will punish them. Well, what's the punishment? We will fine them. Well, the, the reason they're running the deficit is they don't have enough money. So now you're saying we will fine them, and, and it should have been very clear that there, there was no automatic way to correct that if anything that then makes them run a larger deficit if they can't cut spending on their own then then making them run a larger deficit is not the solution and certainly not the path to monetary soundness so now they're talking about saving it by having what what's being called quasi-automatic corrective measures well i i can't imagine what those will be um, the, the beauty of the gold standard is it was truly automatic and, and a government punished itself because people said, I want to bail out of our currency. I'd rather have the gold and that automatically then reduced the money supply. Uh, until we have something like that, what's being discussed for the Euro, some kind of, um, court, some kind of higher court of law would decide if a country is overspending. Can you Imagine how everyone will rebel at a, a German-dominated court telling Greeks what they should spend for. Um, it does the opposite of what Eisenhower had hoped was instead of forging a peaceful alliance, it, it exacerbates the tensions between the sovereign nations. So that's not the solution. And whether they can find something in time enough to preserve the euro as more than just a, a political cover um, or an excuse for further fiscal abuse.
um, that remains to be seen. Um, I, I met Bernard von Nothaus recently, and I had been following his case with great interest. What's rather shocking to me is um, he issued these, I would call them coins, I think he, he was careful not to call them coins because he knew that he was coming very close to infringing on what the Fed sees as its area of authority, but they were gold and silver. People were accept, accepting them as payment voluntarily. He never claimed they were money, but they were voluntarily accepting them. And I think he was doing rather well with his, his private minting. He was, um, he was investigated with people, I think several agents waiting to see what he would do and questioning people who had accepted these tokens in payment. And when he went through his trial, which I thought would be the most fascinating trial, um, I, I called him the, uh, the Rosa Parks of uh, monetary policy because he's challenging, challenging what the federal government has done with regard to carrying out its constitutional um, responsibility to maintain the value of, of U.S. money. He's challenging them. And he was found guilty, I think for some accounts, I don't really understand, counterfeiting or some other, it didn't really make sense to me because nobody mistook these. They don't look at all like, like um, the coins produced by our mint. Um, but even worse, he was called, as he was sentenced, he was called by the prosecuting attorney a domestic terrorist. That I found frightening. Uh, a domestic terrorist. And the irony, uh, I mean, it would be funny if it weren't so serious and, and frightening with regard to the government's power relative to what the founders had in mind, particularly in granting the money power to government, the limited money power. Uh, the dollar was losing value uh, at the rate you referred to in the last 10 years, uh, vastly depreciating the purchasing power or the reliability of the dollar at the same time that these these gold alternative forms of money gold and silver were increasing in value i mean people were very comfortable or, or increasing in value only if you compare them to the dollar they stayed the same they were actual ounces of gold or silver or or paper claims to gold and silver they didn't change they were really what the founders had in mind, these unchanging measures to define in terms of gold and silver. And yet the Fed was able to bring this suit and um, felt that he had encroached on its exclusive right to provide the money. I, I, I'll be very interested in his appeal and see how that goes. But right now, uh, I think he's looking at um, uh, many, many years in prison for having dared to challenge the Federal Reserve.